Thank you very much. So we move on to the next speaker, and now we come to genetics in um, pancreatic astroma. And we have two excellent speakers. And following yeah, we the manager, which has uh, mentioned in the program, we will start with Daniel Kapra. He's yep. going to speak on polygenetic, polygenic and growth factor risk scores in TDEC risk prediction. And I think we will hear a lot of interesting things about how to do this and how this might be changed in the future. Uh, yeah, look very much forward to your talk. Thanks. So thank you very much. Good, good morning to everyone. Thank you to Mitros and Peter for inviting me. Thank you, Jonas. So my name is Daniele Campa. I work at the University of Pisa. I am a, a genetic epidemiologist and uh, I am the co-coordinator of the pancreatic disease or Pandora for our friends here research consortium. These are a couple of uh, peaks of uh, my city, which I took because we are famous for the tower, but we also have the river and the storm sea, as you can see. Now let's cut to the chase. So I am an epidemiologist, so I couldn't resist to put on the left side of this slide some risk factors that you always, obviously you know, but just to point out that we do not have one for, uh, for pancreatic cancer. So there is not a causative risk, a environmental or lifestyle factor. What about genetics? For so genetics, it's not that much better because we do not have a high penetrance mutation. So we have some moderate penetrant mutation in uh, genes involved in cell cycle or DNA damage uh, repair. And uh, we have found some high frequency and low penetrant uh, loci in the genome with a GWAS. And let's take a closer look to these guys. So we have 28 of them, 28 loci and uh, Obviously, they are associated with a very low p-value, so we are sure about them. The majority of those have been uh, identified in uh, Caucasians, and they are, for vast majority, not inside genes. So they are in, in non-coding regions, except for the one in ABO. Let's take an even closer look. So for example, let's look at this guy here on chromosome 16. It's a uh, single variant, very low value. It's quite frequent in the population because it has the minor allele frequency of 5%, and this is the rarest one of all the bunch. And so, so far so good. What's the problem? The problem is that, and this is one of the major critiques of uh, GWA studies for uh, determin determining uh, um, risk, genetic risk, is the fact that the Increase of risk is 45, 46%. So basically, they have a, all these NIPs have a small effect and they are not useful in risk prediction. This was one of the critiques that now is a little bit more muted because the idea here is that we have the information and we have to use it wisely. So obviously, pancreatic cancer is a polygenic disorder, it is a complex polygenic disorder. You cannot expect to have one single variant, which is a, which could explain the disease, you need many. So how can you use them? Well, one idea, which is very hot topic now in medicine, and of course in uh, epidemiology, in genetics, as you can imagine, is polygenic risk scores. What's the idea? So the idea is that in a, in a population like this, you have a, small number of individuals with low risk, uh, lo low number of risk alleles. The average, the majority of the population with uh, an average number of risk alleles and the low number of individuals with high risk uh, alleles. So a uh, high number of risk alleles. And what you want is that you want to find those. You want to identify these guys in the population. So we did it. We, we, we tried this approach, we use the 28 uh, known loci, plus we add the, the couple of SNPs that are used to infer the ABO blood group. And we did it in uh, the Pancreatic Disease Research uh, Consortium, we did it in Pandora. 
We use approximately 9,000 individuals from various uh, countries in Europe. Of course, there is uh, Hungary here, and there is also Poland, uh, thanks to Eva, which is there. And uh, well, it is very simple. Here you have all the individuals, and here you have the risk candidates. So, for example, for, for this guy, uh, you have the, the, the green ones are risk candidates, the other ones are not. So, for this guy, for example, in, in, we just have three SNPs, but we use 28. You have three risk candidates, so you just add them up, and then uh, every individual has a score. And so, for example, individual one has a score of three, then three, then six, and so forth. If you just put them in, uh, plot them in a uh, number of uh, uh, risk elites, you can see here that the cases and the controls, cases are the red ones, controls are the blue ones, differ from the, the distribution of risk elites. So the controls are much likely to, the cases are much likely to have uh, a high number of risk elites while the controls do not have. Now, uh, if you want to do the things a little bit more complicated, there are various ways on, on doing polygenic risk scores, but these are the, the easiest and the simplest one. The idea is that you have to, if you remember from the table, from my, one of my first tables, not all the SNPs have the same uh, odds ratios. So they don't count exactly in the same way to predicting uh, uh, risk. So you want to weight them for their uh, actual association with the disease. So you basically multiply these odds ratios or beta for the number of elites, and then you sum them up. And you again have a score here. The score is, is it, and then you're treating exactly the same way. So just as an exploratory analysis, uh, we also added a couple of uh, environmental risk factor. If we can call diabetes environmental, but let's say not genetics risk factor, even though you cannot say that diabetes is not genetics, of course, and to calculate the multifactorial risk score. So what we got? Here are the odds ratios for, as you can see, unweighted and weighted score, the same odds ratios, 2.7. And uh, if you add also the uh, environmental risk factors, so we reach an odds ratio of 14. And as you can see, the p values here are very low. So there is no way that this is not true. Just to put in perspective, the BSC1 breast cancer mutation, germline breast cancer mutation, have an odds ratio depending on which mutation from 4 to 20. The smoking and lung cancer is from 6 to 40. And ACV infection and uh, hepatocellular catching are from five to one hundred. So, are we happy about this? No, we are not. First thing that we did is that we replicated our results because in genetics epidemiology you cannot not do that. And we used uh, samples from the uh, Panscan and Panci4 consortia in the, at the NCI. And uh, we did the same, then we pulled everything together. So we here have around 20,000 individuals. And as you can see, the odds ratios are basically the same, three, p values at the minus 56. So, all right, the association is there, there is no doubt. Prediction, well, prediction is lousy, you can see. I'll see of 0 0.68, 67. So what do we do? Are we happy? No, we are not. Why? So what, what can we do to improve this thing? Well, Jonas, you use the, the metaphor of the, of the apple tree because you're German and you have the best apples in the world, at least in Europe. I know that because I lived in Germany for eight years. And I use another one, which is the iceberg. So what we have with GWAS data is just the tip of the iceberg. So, but the tip of the iceberg doesn't do any damage. What we need to do is to go deeper in the water and find these guys. We have to find them and put them in the, in the, in the, in the scores that we do. So PDAC, pancreatic cancer, has an estimated irritability that goes from 20%, 0.2 to 0.3. We just know the 3%. So it means that we know one, we need, we, we know 10% of the, the polymorphic variants that are associated with the disease. 
it's clear that this is not clinically still usable because we need uh, to find more variants which are uh, associated and we need to discard the ones which are irrelevant. Can we do that? Yes, because one of the other critiques is, uh, okay, guys, you're doing GWAS studies, they are very expensive, and then you find a nutritious, which is 1.4, and we cannot use that. It's true, but now the GWAS are very cheap. So for 44, 40, 45, sorry, euros, you can have one of these uh, mostly used commercial arrays, which is the global clean array, which interrogates 250 k SNPs in one go. And with some uh, genetic term, black magic or opus focus, which I cannot explain here because it's complicated, you can uh, use those NIPs to have information of millions of variants. And so you don't even use, you don't even necessarily need to do, to do uh, NGS to have these informations. Then GWAS are not invasive. You need some, a little bit of speed, or you need the buccal swap, and they have another advantage, advantage on other things which have been uh, also uh, mentioned earlier, like epigenetics or the microbiome or the uh, genomics, that this is stable. You have to do it once in your lifetime. When you're done, you're done. You don't need to do it repeatedly. So for example, microbiome, which is, uh, or epigenetics, which is obviously now uh, very trendy, you have to do it repeatedly, otherwise it doesn't mean anything. So what should we do? We have to discover new variants. We obviously have to include low frequency variants and how to discover new variants and which techniques we can use, Federico will, will talk about them in, in a few. And, and then we can use it for finding individual entities. So before you jump in your seat and you say, okay, but PDAC is a rare disease. It's a rare disease, sorry. So it's not screenable. It's true, it's a rare disease, it's not screenable. Then what we can do, but we do not, do not have to screen the overall population. We, have, we know that there are individuals that have an increased risk of, uh, in, of developing PDAC, like for example, diabetics, obese individuals, IPMNs, or smokers. So we can, for what, what Pali said, I don't know where it, before, it was really interesting that you are setting up a court for new onset diabetes because this would really fit well with this, with this thing. So with, in this guys, it would be much easier to find the individuals that are at risk because not all diabetics, not all smokers, not all obese, not all EPMNs develop pancreatic cancer, but some do and some don't. Why? Well, it would be naive to think that there is not genetics involved there. So with this, I would like to thank you all. And these are the, the girls and boys that work in my lab. And this was taken, this, post, this picture was taken a couple of days uh, ago in our sunny botanical garden. Okay, so I'm beyond time, even shorter. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you, for this very excellent talk. And um, the pointing out of the uselessness of the microbiome. No, no, no. I'm, I mean, I really like it. One of my guys works, a couple of two of my guys working. I, I really do like it. But, you know, microbiome has to be. We have to be cautious. Yeah, but because you don't know which is the cause, like yeah. the disease or the, the microbiome that changes. Yeah, so. Let's see what we're talking about in 10 years. About, about yes. Yeah. But genetics stay, I'm sure. Yeah. Peter, Fantastic talk, and uh, I really, really feel that one of the best decisions we made in the past in the pancreatic study group to join Pandora. So for you and Federico, really, yeah, we, really, we are very happy that you are here. Thank you, uh, and we hope that we can even further and with a bigger extent contribute. My question is from the clinical side. Yeah, we will have a risk factor, risk assessment, which is brilliant. We need it definitely. However, I think about the specificity and sensitivity because we have 20% of population or 
the diabetes growing, obesity, 60% of the population obese. So which means if we test that psychologically, the false positive or just the risk, how their life will be changed. So if I am get the information that I have a like, like this high risk factor and the penetration for these patients to pancreatic in cancer is low. So for example, we threaten you know, a huge amount of uh, patients, what to do with them psychologically. So uh, how, how, so what do you think about this risk factor? How further you can develop? So how specifically you can isolate this kind of person? Because we can make harm if it's not too specific. Okay, thank you, excellent question. So um, this is something that you definitely have to take into account, of course. But uh, the fact is that now we, I mean, it would be nice to have that problem because now we cannot, we don't have it. So we, we, don't, sure. we don't have anything. And- uh, What is your prediction that how far it can go? Uh, I think obviously not just with genetics, like cancer sick is, uh, you need to have other markets. I'm not just here, I'm not here saying that there is only genetics. Epigenetics will play a role, protein will play a role, the microbiome will play a role. But then when you have the, the tool, because one of the problems of pancreatic cancer is that there is no symptoms. So, I mean, you cannot say people because it's like backache or nausea. So, I mean, there is nothing. So if you have a tool, then you can decide to use it or not, it depends. But if you do not have the tool, you don't have this, uh, uh, you cannot do it, okay? So, um, Few questions. Yeah, very nice talk. Uh, we showed the, the chymotrypsin B uh, variant and you know there's a new study showing that this is actually linked to a deletion variant. Did you confirm that or did you ever study that if that's really true? Uh, no, I don't remember that specific variant, but we did the study in, uh, in Pandora with the SNPs uh, that were uh, identified by Jonas and by Professor Whitcomb. And for some, there was something, but it was really weak. So I'm not really sure that there is this. Uh, so there's say, a very, very specific study which claimed that the association seen in cancer is really driven by an exonic large deletion in chymotrypsin B. Okay, so no, no, we never, we never. So I think that. that would be very interesting to yes. replicate. So if it's true at all, right? Because yes. as we point out with this small odds ratios, it's easier to find, you know, just the spurious association. Well, spurious, uh, yeah, it depends on your sample size. If, course, if, yes. if it's yeah. a single study, right? Yeah, yeah. And so my other question, it looks to me that if you combine all your 28 SNPs, you get an odds ratio around three, right? Yeah. So, and then, so now you start looking under the surface and, but you're most likely gonna find even lower odds ratios, right? So if you start multiplying those in, how much can you improve this? So, okay, the, the fact is that you have those odds ratios because you anyway identify a large proportion of the population. When you, if you build up and you add a list, obviously the number of individuals that you identify is smaller and then your odds ratio will go higher. It's just a mathematical thing. So uh, I don't know much, I cannot say that, but for, for example, for, for breast cancer, they have the same odds ratio as uh, high penetrance mutation. And then you combine them. For breast cancer, they are lucky because they have high penetrance mutation and then the score. And then if you put together everything, then uh, your prediction ability is, is higher. For pancreatic cancer, we don't have, so we need to have other information. Any more questions? I just have one. Yep. There was one slide with an odds ratio of 40. I don't know if, yes. Yeah, and then it's 185 patients. Yes. Is this 185 from the 10,000 you put in at the beginning? Yes, because uh, that's one of the problems of Pandora. We have a lot of good information for, for the cases, but as you know very well, when you do case control studies, the problem are the controls. Yes. So. We don't have a lot of uh, data from the controls. That's why I said it, that it is preliminary. Probably 14, it's, uh, it's blown up a little bit. Yeah. And um, 
but yes, that that was the problem. That's what we have right now. So unfortunately, yeah. Okay. If there are no further questions, thank you.